craving these awful, awful roads <laughs> that are coming out here today. Um, and thank you to our panelists who also braved the roads and came out here today. We did lose one panelist, uh, Katie Trouts, who is going to talk to us about uh, crowdfunding with uh, with uh, platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Um, she could not make it because of the roads, but she did. She does have a uh, one sheet with some tips for crowdfunding um, that you can take home and look at. Um, but yeah, so I'm Dominic Spillane with uh, Theater Engine, and the Spark Artist Series is uh, something we want to get together, get get going, and hopefully to do more of, where it's a, it's a, ch it's a chance to learn some things that maybe you don't know about. Um, and But also, we're trying to invite some more discussion, so our panelists are going to talk a little bit about what they do and what they know, and you know, tell you a little bit about, uh, about that. But also, afterwards, we really want to hear from you as well, and hear about fundraising things that you've tried and had success with or not had success with. So uh, we really want this to feel like a discussion. Uh, so uh, also I want to say thank you so much to our sponsors uh, that allowed us to do this and make it free for uh, the artist community. So that's uh, Burlington City Arts. So we thank them for this beautiful facility. Um, community Capital of Vermont, uh, Main Street uh, Landing Performing Arts Center, uh, the Radiator, and uh, Heart Digital. So thank you for our sponsors. Did you uh, introduce Theater Engine? Uh, Theater Engine is a uh, online platform for the performing arts. Um, so we're just trying to make it more accessible for uh, for people to find out about you know, theater events that are going on around you. And uh, we're still building and beta testing, but we've got some stuff up there right now. So check it out. Yeah. Um, I'm Jim Lockridge from Big Heavy World. Big Heavy World is a volunteer-run office in Burlington that supports all kinds of music from across the state. We operate a small community radio station, a music archive, and a website. If you're a musician, uh, I'd love to connect with you before you sweat tonight. I invite you on to our local music radio show Wednesday nights called Rocket Shop. Check out BigHeavyWorld.com to stream the station or see what's going on. Um, what you're being a part of now is a, a collaborative effort between Dominic and Hana and Big Heavy World, um, bringing theater and dance and music together as a community um, for these kinds of conversations that are meant to help us all help ourselves as an arts community, as a creative community. So, um, you know, I, I, I hope you feel very warmly welcome into the Q&A following the panelists and, and bringing some of your experience into the conversation later on. Um, super important. Hear me say, at the end of this, or going around the corner and hanging out at a bar, <laughs> whiskey room is, you walk to the road right there, and you take a left, you're going to be standing in front of a big white marble building that says whiskey room over the door. That's where we're going afterwards to simply hang out. So uh, if you're feeling social and you want to carry the conversation forward with a pint in front of you, that's what we're doing. Um, and uh, this is Hannah. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Hannah. I direct the Vermont Dance Alliance, and we are a young nonprofit working to enrich, expand, and connect the dance community throughout the entire state, and also now kind of merging into New England, and also we're participating in a national um, choreography month called Natmo in January, so if anybody is invited to participate, it's like a month-long kick in the pants to make a piece, and then we'll show it at Karma Birdhouse in February. So I'll tell you more about that in a social mixer, but I just want to say thank you to everyone that's been involved. This has been a really enjoyable collaboration. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Now we're going to turn it over first to Dominique Gustin of the Vermont Arts Council. So my name is Dominique Gustin, and I'm the Artist Services Manager with the Vermont Arts Council. And I'd like to thank Dominic and Jim and Hannah for putting the Smart Artist Workshop Series together and extending an invitation to present. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Vermont Arts Council, I'm going to just walk you through a very brief introduction of what we do. Um, and so I'll start. The Vermont Arts Council is a 501c3 organization. And it's been designated by the state of Vermont to function as the state artist agency. Our mission is to cultivate and advance the arts and creativity throughout Vermont, and we do this in a number of ways. The Vermont 
creative network is something I'll start with. It's a broad collective of organizations, businesses, and individuals all working to advance um, Vermont's creative sector. Um, the Arts Council facilitates the development of the network and currently a comprehensive research-based action plan for moving Vermont's creative economy forward is underway. Um, if you'd like to learn more or get involved, I encourage you to connect with your zone representative. Um, and Jim Lockridge is here tonight, um, is the zone agent for Chittenden County. Um, and there are also some brochures with more information um, in the hallway. Um, I'm going to touch on various grant programs next, beginning with support for arts education. Um, our programs include a teaching artist roster, um, artists on the council's roster are professionals with extensive experience in education and are eligible to leave residencies supported by our artists in schools grants. Um, the deadline applying for the teaching artist roster is March 29th and happens once a year. And criteria include artistic excellence, teaching ability, and collaborative planning skills. The Council's Artists in Schools grants provide funding to schools to hire and collaborate with artists in the classroom. Head Start residencies support arts integrated experiences for early education students and teachers in Head Start classrooms. And Poetry Out Loud um, is um, a national competition for high school students. Um, if you'd like more information, um, Troy Hickman is our Education Program Manager and he'd be happy to talk more with you about those programs. <clears throat> we also support public art and placemaking projects through cultural facilities grants. Um, these are intended to enhance, create, or expand the capacity of an existing building to provide cultural activities for the public. The deadline for that is May 1st. Um, art and state buildings. This program is administered by the Vermont Arts Council in partnership with the Department of Buildings and General Services. And it's dedicated to enhancing working environments by improving the character and quality of state-owned buildings and public spaces. The most recent installation of art related to this program was Big Frog, which you see there by artist Jim Sardonis, and it's at the Vermont Agriculture and Environmental Laboratory located in Randolph Center. Um, we also have animating infrastructure projects. These support community projects that integrate art with infrastructure improvements in communities. And if you'd like more information about those programs, Michelle Bailey is our senior program manager of the council. <clears throat> Other funding opportunities for arts organizations um, through the council include our Arts Impact and Arts Partnership Grants. Arts Impact Grants open February with the May 1st deadline and support nonprofit organizations, municipalities, and schools in their efforts to add vibrancy to Vermont communities by providing equal and abundant access to the arts. And the council seeks applications for projects that identify and break down barriers to participation. And if you'd like more information about those, Meredith Bell is our Grants and Information Associate. The Arts Partnership Program is designed to support 501c3 arts organizations and um, that, that also offer year-round high-quality arts programs and services and have the grant itself has a three-year cycle. And the next three-year cycle um, opens in February with the May 15th deadline. I'm responsible for managing the creation and artist development grants. These are for individual artists. Um, and creation grants support the creation of new work. They can fund time, materials, and space rental for artists or artist groups living in Vermont. Um, this is a highly competitive program. It's reviewed by an independent panel of practicing artists and curators. And the grant amount for this program is $4,000 <laughs> per award. In our last grant round, we were able to award, award 15 different artists across the creative disciplines, uh, musicians, poets, visual artists, filmmakers, dance, etc. Um, five more than the previous year, and we're committed to um, continuing our efforts to increase funding so that we're able to support more of the amazing projects that are proposed each year. Um, some examples of fundable projects include a writer completing the first draft of a novel, um, a dance ensemble developing choreography for a new piece, a visual artist creating art for exhibition that explores new subjects and techniques. Um, we've 
funded musicians uh, with new music um, across all of the different uh, genres and um, multimedia projects, etc. <clears throat> we also have artist development grants. Um, artist development grants support artists in all stages of their careers and can fund activities that enhance mastery of an artist's craft or skills, activities that increase the viability of an artist's business, um, or support aspects of the creation of new work when the activity allows for a grantee to accept a rare and important opportunity. Um, examples of el eligible activities include advanced study of technique or practice with a mentor, attending a professional conference or building business or artistic skills or knowledge, contracting professional services, including photographic documentation of your work, contract preparation or business incorporation, creation of accounting systems, e-commerce on a website, uh, marketing materials, um, can cover planning, purchasing some materials or renting space for new exhibitions or performances and travel within the United States. Awards typically range between $250 and $1,000, and artists may apply to one of the upcoming deadlines for submission. There are usually three. Um, the one in September is passed. There's one coming up with the deadline January 6th, and then the next one is May 4th. Some other online resources I wanted to mention, if you aren't already familiar with our website, um, log on and take a look. We have an arts calendar, which is a statewide crowdsourced calendar, and you can find events, exhibits, workshops, etc., and uh, classified listings, which is a great place to find jobs, call to artists, um, art supplies, funding, um, conferences, residency announcements, and more. Um, and our online resources and knowledge center help artists research, discover next steps or get started in a new direction. And some examples include links to national and regional organizations that support the arts and artists and um, business and legal resources, insurance and disaster preparedness, uh, resources for funding across a wide range of different uh, creative disciplines, accessibility information, it's, there's a lot there. And last, each year, um, the Arts Council recognizes outstanding individual and organizational contributions for the arts in Vermont uh, with a variety of awards, and these are presented at various public ceremonies and provide an opportunity for the recipient to be honored by colleagues, friends, family, and members of the communities where they live and work. Um, we also maintain the Spotlight Gallery and Sculpture Garden, which are open to the public during office hours. We're located on State Street by the Visitor Center across from the State House. And that concludes the tour of programs. And I encourage everybody to stop by the council if you're not familiar and or give us a call because we'd love to connect. <laughs> Oh, you want to scan it? Yeah. That's it. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty good. All right. Hi. Um, I'm Alice. I have many hats, um, and so I'm going to kind of just talk about a little bit about some some of them. Um, I'm a visual artist in Montpelier, where I'm also the executive director of the Center for Arts and Learning on Berry Street. Um, and I'm a member of the Front Collective Gallery in Montpelier also. Um, I was the grant writer for a little while for the Vermont Studio Center as well. Um, and I started doing that in Minnesota, where I got my MFA. Um, I, I wanted to talk just a little bit about some of the ways um, some of the funding that I see funding models kind of working here in Vermont and a little bit about grants and just share some some ideas that might be useful to some people um, as we're thinking about kind of why it's possible to successfully fund an organization here versus elsewhere, which is something I've been thinking a lot about. So um, the Center for Arts and Learning in Montpelier, if you don't know it, it's it's 
unique. It's a partnership between three organizations, the T.W. Wood Gallery, Monteverdi Music School, and River Rock School, which is like a K through eight school. Um, they got together to buy the old convent that they were already, they were renting space there. So they got together to purchase the building a few years ago. Um, and they formed Center for Arts and Learning as a way to run it. So we um, rent out spaces to artists and musicians, and we're developing programs like visual arts exhibitions and concerts and poetry readings and stuff like that. Um, funding that development has been a major challenge, um, mostly because the building itself has required a ton of capital investment. And so that's sort of where we focused our fundraising and all of our time and energy. Um, so that's been you know, a challenge, but that said, having three totally different organizations working together has really allowed each of them to build long-term equity in the building. Um, and we are getting to a point now where, where Center for Arts and Learning is able to build its own programs as well. Um, so, one of the things that I've been doing since I've been there is figuring out ways to kind of use the advantages of that partnership arrangement, but also how to communicate what it is effectively to granting agencies that are kind of expecting a more traditional nonprofit when we're applying for funding. Um, I'm also a member at The Front, which is a cooperative gallery in Montpelier and not a nonprofit. Um, we're collectively owned by the members, so everyone chips in money to cover rent and utilities and um, time to cover staffing. It's a really simple model, but so far it's actually seemed to work. We've been around for about five years, um, and the thing that I've noticed in that time is just how much more Montpelier's art scene has grown and how vibrant it's becoming. Um, maybe that's total coincidence, I don't know, but um, a lot of the artists from the front end up showing in local businesses and we're doing more art walks and there's more business participation in them generally. Um, and I've also noticed that the quality of our work is all improving because we're able to bounce ideas off of each other. We're getting, you know, every time we do a call for new members, we're getting more and better applications. So that's really exciting. Um, and I think that the thing that I love most about it is that the model ultimately contributes a lot to the ecosystem of the whole area, but it's not a tremendous amount of investment from each member of the gallery. Um, one thing that I sort of want to talk about that's, I guess, a little bit broader than grants, but grants is part of it, is just what I've noticed about Vermont's funding landscape as opposed to Minnesota, where I started out writing grants. I moved there to get my MFA and ended up working for a nonprofit visual art space um, called Midway Contemporary Art. They have a gallery and a contemporary art library, and they're known for sometimes what can be intense and elaborate installations, kind of like what you'd see in a high-end commercial gallery in New York. Um, all of the programming is free. So since moving back to Vermont and working here, I've kind of wondered, you know, what goes into something like Midway being able to sustain itself for going on 20 years now. Um, their model is kind of like a European Kunsthalle, if you know what that is. It's a, it's, those are generally state-funded exhibition spaces that really allow the artists to totally explore an idea and present a, a full vision. Um, it sort of seems unlikely that that could work somewhere in the US, especially that somewhere that's not New York or LA. Um, but Midway was one of several spaces that started in the Twin Cities in the early 2000s. And I've been thinking a lot about you know, what contributed to the climate there that really made that work. Um, one thing is that Minneapolis has a really strong creative economy that leads to supportive, engaged board members and really great donors. Um, there's, you know, there's Target, there's the Walker Art Center and the Guthrie Theater that are really established. And there's a lot of people that I think see themselves as part of that creative economy and, and for whom the arts are a really big influence, but they might not be able to quite participate on the level that's required to be a board member at the Walker Art Center. So they are willing to say, you know, I can make a contribution that's like $1,000 or even $10,000 to make you know, a really great exhibition happen at a smaller space or make a theater production happen. Um, 
and and there's you know more than just a handful of people who can do that. <laughs> so that's that's one factor. And the second is as a government support. I mean, in 2008, artists and organizers teamed up with other groups to pass the um, Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment, which is a constitutional amendment to the state constitution that guarantees arts funding as well as clean water and environmental restoration, um, parks funding, and recreation funding. So it was this, it was this interesting collaboration between artists and a lot of people in the like hunting and recreation community. They, they created a small sales tax, and that has been just tremendous for funding the arts there. Um, here in Vermont, you know, we've got amazing people at the Arts Council, but, you know, we have $1.15 spending per capita on the arts in Vermont from the government. And in Minnesota, it's seven twenty six. dollars So that kind of gives you an idea of just the difference. Um, and that really exceeds any other state, but you can actually see the difference that it's made in the economy there. Um, a third thing is just the foundations um, that are arts focused and primarily arts focused, I'd say. Um, they, you know, we, we received funding from the McKnight Foundation, the Jerome Foundation, the Bush Foundation for a long time, and, um, and some national ones like the Warhol Foundation that are really committed not only to the arts in general, but to developing high artistic quality and innovation. And that I think is really key because, you know, in grant proposals, you could talk specifically about artistic goals and they understood that context. Um, one of the ideas that was really important for me when I was writing grants for Midway was the idea of, uh, creating deferred value and kind of contributing to a larger cultural conversation. So we would have investment in this little tiny organization, but that would ripple throughout the economy. Um, one example, we did a show with the artist Nick Mouse, and he wanted to do this crazy installation with a velvet room that recreated a 1930s Paris boudoir kind of thing. Um, and so we worked with him, found the fabricator, built the thing, installed it, and like probably a couple of hundred people maybe saw it at that exhibition. But then he got into invited to the Whitney Biennial. And so we worked with them to reinstall the piece there. And then it was seen by you know tens of thousands of people. So that's kind of one of the things that's important to me to try and convey to funders is this is you know not something that's just gonna benefit us it's gonna ripple through the whole community. Um, since coming back to Vermont, you know, I'm still learning about what the challenges are here and how to navigate the funding landscape. And probably you'll talk more about that, but um, one of the challenges I think is that most of the grants are really small. Um, they're under $5,000 and it's really hard to do a small project and also measure the impact of that project with that money. And what happens is, you know, you receive some funding, but not really enough. And then it kind of spirals downwards because you can't adequately report on it. Therefore, the next time you don't get the funding. And so that's like, not good. So you need to be aware of how much it's really going to cost and what you can really do for that amount of um, second, a lot of the grants are project-based, which can be really great, but a lot of the time what you really need is money for salaries and rent and administrative costs and super boring things. Um, so in other places, I think that money might be coming more from your individual donors, but if you don't have that donor base here, it's, it, that can be really hard. So I think that we need to kind of consider our tendency here to say, well, the artist is going to do their work for free. Mm. And that's, you know, it's great that there's that generosity that here a lot of projects do happen that way, but we have to start changing that and building it into our grants to say, no, we need to pay the artists um, and pay yourself for your time. Um, those kinds of costs I think are important to include. Um, three is that a lot of the applications I've found here 
are really labor intensive. Like there are still some foundations where you could write a one page letter, say this is what we want to do, and they'll just decide, and that's great. Um, but you know, there has been this trend towards accountability through statistics and metrics, which I think is not bad. I mean, it's coming from social services and it makes a lot of sense for them to want to know, you know, who you're serving, what their income level is, what your impact is. But a lot of those things are just really not what you need to be measuring in the arts. A lot of our impact can't really be measured that way. It's much more qualitative, much more diffuse. Um, and sometimes the format of the application can kind of, you know, cut down on your ability to tell your story. Um, so I think it's, it's really important to be clear where you can in your narrative about what you're doing so that you can show them, you know, what the vision for the project is and not necessarily have to rely so much on their statistics to show that and tell that story for you. Um, you know, foundations are also trying to save on costs, so a lot of the time they'll make standardized applications that are used across different foundations, like common software, that kind of thing, for submitting grants, um, which is good because it means sometimes you can apply to more than one thing at once or use basically the same format, um, but it also means that sometimes you end up not really being able to articulate what you're doing in a clear way way because the form is kind of, you know, keeping you from doing that. Um, I think the thing that I found most about that that's helpful is to just call the program officer if you can, talk to them, see what it is that they're really looking for, what, what piece of information it is that is important to them, because it's not always clear from the applications. Um, I think we're just at a really interesting point where we're beginning to build some networks of smaller organizations here, and hopefully we're gonna be able to kind of shape how the arts funding will work here. I think there's going to be a push for more alternative models and hopefully a push for more public support, um, because I think we could become a place like Minnesota where there's just a lot more support for the arts that ends up reinvesting in the community and ends up bringing up the quality of what's being produced so that people can really make a living at it, you know, so that it's sustainable long term. Preach. <laughs> Seriously, I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in because I also lived in Minnesota for a long time and I got to say the Legacy Amendment is like the best thing to have happened to the arts, historic preservation was the other piece and then um, the, the outdoors and, and water. Um, and it, it anyway. So if we if there's anything that we could all do as artists and people who run arts organizations, and that is to somehow like advocate for that kind of commitment on the state level for people to really say yes, we believe in these things. This is a value that we hold to our hearts. Having arts and the culture and historic preservation and the outdoors and it's worth it for us to pay the one it's like point zero one like, yeah, percent it's, it's so it's little like three eights yeah. <laughs> um but it makes such a huge difference and it allows small arts or uh, small arts organizations and individual artists to thrive there so um Different uh, here. <laughs> I'm Abby Solomon. I'm from Community Capital of uh, Vermont. So we are a nonprofit, um, non-traditional lender in the state. Um, we do micro lending, so our loans are thousand to hundred thousand. Right now, we're averaging around uh, twenty-five thousand is our average loan. Um, but there's a point that artists need to look at what they're creating as a business because it is. Um, my background, my mom is a practicing artist. She taught art forever because she needed to feed us, <laughs> but she's now a potter and that's her full-time job. I've attempted to, I've belonged to artist co-ops and, um, been involved in the art world too. Um, but now I'm doing this. <laughs> so, uh, there, there's a lot of different ways that artists can, um, look at lenders or go to lenders for um, 
you know, obviously there's the, the tangible things that you need. Um, if you need a vehicle to get around for performing or you need um, just, just paint, there's, there's things you need to pay for. And as much as grants are wonderful, they're incredibly hard to get. They're more, they're easier for artists than other types of small businesses. That's one of the things I always get asked by all small businesses is, well, I just, I, I want a grant for that, which is wonderful. We all want money <laughs> <laughs> for free, but it is very hard. Um, and it's, it takes time also. Um, so we offer um, loans to businesses who can't get um, loans through traditional means. So there's various reasons for that. Small loans, banks aren't going to touch you. Um, startups, rarely are, are banks going to look at you. If you have some personal credit issues or you just don't really have collateral, um, we're able to be a, more creative with all those things. So um, community capital uh, works with all sectors of Vermont businesses, only Vermont businesses. Um, and art, artist wise, I've, I've worked with painters who need a small credit line because they do craft fairs and they can be expensive to, to buy into initially. She knows she's going to make the money back. So she, she needs that upfront cost when like right now, when you're trying to get in all these shows for next summer, um, you're not necessarily making in lots of money on selling right now so you need some upfront cash now and then when you do the show you pay it back and it's you're just paying interest on lines of credit that way um we work with the um the youth orchestra and very same deal they have a small credit line um so they do a uh camp every summer so there's upfront costs they need there but they know that they're going to get money and be able to pay that down um, so having to pay for money, you're, again, grants are, are what you want. I get that, <laughs> but there, there are other options and you need to look at your, your art and your, as a business. Um, so one of the, the pieces of paper that's in your packet there is, um, a list of what lenders, specifically community capital, but it's really any lender that you're going to end up going to is going to need in order for a business loan. So very small loans, there's less documentation required with that. But if long term, you're looking to make a living, having a business plan is really smart to do and put that work in. Um, there's organizations come from tons of them in Vermont to help you build those. So right in um, Burlington, there's Mercy Connections, there's uh, the CWE, and then of course SBDC, um, all free services to help you with business planning and, um, and to develop your business plan. Um, and then it is gonna come down to financials. So you, you're gonna need to know what you're gonna be needing to expend and kind of what you're expecting to get back. Of course, projections are not gonna be there's no way to be positive on those. I mean, sure of them. We understand that those numbers are, are they should be based on fact, on history of what you've been doing or what you know business that's coming in. But um, it's, it's not a sure thing. We understand that as, as lenders. So it's, it's good to put that work in if for long term you're looking at, at a business. Um, so we can do very small loans that, or lines of credit, and then we can go further. And for collateral, uh, we, can, we can look at what your business has physically, but then we can look if you have somebody who could be a third party guarantor towards the loan, or if you do own your own home, you can put that towards, towards the loan. And then at Community Capital, we're really active with our borrowers. So the communication is really important. If you know that in two months, it's really going to be a low period, you're not going to be having any sales or any um, sort of income, we will work with you to do interest only for a couple months. So we're not like completely putting you out. Or um, we, different industry, but we work with the maple industry and that's very seasonal. So we can do almost monthly balloon payments when the season's actually in. So if you're 
not doing much, if you're, whatever your, your art or your craft is, is very seasonal, we can look at that and, and make it, make your payments work for what your business is. Um, there's a few lenders like us. So VCLF in um, Montpelier, Vermont Community Loan Fund, and then VITA, who are similar to us, mission-based lenders in the state. Um, they aren't as focused on micro, and in the lending world, anything 50,000 and, and under is micro. Um, but they are also, they will work with people who aren't necessarily gonna be able to go to the bank and get a loan. Um, and then there are a lot of banks in Vermont that are being a lot more open to taking a bit more risk with, with businesses. Um, so a good start is always to go to the bank that you're really, you know, and you're um, familiar with. You're gonna get a better rate there. <laughs> so part of us taking higher risk is the interest rates are a little bit higher, not significantly. It's not like a credit card or anything like that. Um, but borrowing money is an option. Um, it's an option for everybody. Even if you don't think that your income is, it might warrant that or, or what you're doing, it's, it's worth looking into. Um, I know when someone comes to me and might not be completely ready to borrow money, I will be able to refer you on to somebody who's going to be able to help you um, and, and get to that point. So um, it's always, it is always an option and um, you just, you need to be prepared to look at yourself as a business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm actually going to stand up. Is that okay? I, just, I feel like I can't see everyone in the, in the back. Um, so my name is Amanda Rayfuse, and I'm going to not stand quite so close to the camera. Um, and I'm really loud, so hopefully your camera will pick me up anyway. Uh, and uh, I, what's so cool about this, and I, just, I also kind of want to reiterate thanks to the collaborators for making this possible, is that this conversation as it's evolving is so much about all of the things that it takes to build the financing model, right, that artists and organizations need to succeed, that there is no one panacea. There's not one thing that's ever going to make us, it's not, even in Minnesota, where there's this amazing legacy <laughs> amendment, you know, we don't, you don't just rely on the funds that come through these regional arts councils, but you rely on your individual donor bases, you rely on your transactional relationships, your ticket sales, or purchasing, you rely on your, your line of credit, <laughs> absolutely, and your loans, and you rely on your government organizations and your foundations as well, business partnerships. But first, I just wanted to kind of get a sense of who is in the room. So who in the room is an, an individual artist working on your own? Cool. And who in the room is, is part of an organization, um, an artistic organization? Awesome. So that's the other piece that's really interesting isn't it is that there's 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 a pretty significant um or you could imagine that there might be a really significant difference between how an organization develops their financing plan versus how an individual artist so i'm just curious you know i just kind of want to make a mental note about that because that's i really only want to take a couple of minutes so that we can talk more um but just so you guys know, I'm I both I'm I'm a freelance director, a producer, an actor, and I also have worked with big organizations and small organizations. Um, and it says on your little bio sheets that I'm a fundraising and community engagement. I would like you all to cross out the word fundraising because it is <laughs> not in my vocabulary at all. Um, I'm a development specialist and community engagement specialist, and um, if you think about just the just the little difference in those two words, the semantics difference between fundraising and development, that's what I'm super interested in hearing about from you guys, is how do you want to work to create your family of supporters? How do you want to inspire people to become the advocates and the passionate stewards for your art and your organization. Because to me, that's what any kind of financing is about. That's how you tell your story to a bank, to the Arts Council, to any grant writer, but also to the individuals that you want to get to support you. How you're bringing people together and creating a family of supporters that include businesses, foundations, governments, banks, and businesses, and individuals. 
Um, so with that in mind, I um, would, I'm, I'm just, I'd just love to do a little brain game, if you guys don't mind. Um, if you wouldn't mind, for yourselves, keep your arts organization and your and your um, your individual art work out of your mind. And if you don't mind, just for a second, closing your eyes, and I'm going to ask a silly question, and I just ask you not to think too much about it, but to just um, take five seconds or twenty seconds to think for a second, and then if you have a pen and a piece of paper to jot it down. But think about the question: If I were a piece of music. What would I be? It doesn't have to be a piece of music. It could be a type of music. But if I were a piece of music, what would I be? You're going to take a couple seconds to jot that down for yourselves. If you have a pen. So does anyone have one that they would be willing to, to share? <laughs> yeah? I just thought like a song that gets people up and dancing. Awesome, that gets people up and dancing. So what is it about a song like dance music that, um, and, and, and A, how do you envision them dancing in your brain? I just want to pull that thread for a second. Are they doing the cha-cha? Are they raging? Well, I, are I, they I think it's up? like, um, <laughs> I just want to instill that idea of like every day is a party and like we should be out there moving and enjoying however that is for you. Awesome. So just in that like two second interaction, I already have a much clearer picture of who you are as an individual, right? And I understand, like I'm starting to get a little bit to like your personal mission in life. And we all talk about as organizations and as art, particularly organizations, and especially when it comes to grant writing, we have this idea of missions, right? But I actually really firmly believe in the idea of a personal mission of what we do in the world and how we're impacting the world and why we're, it's why we're artists, right? It's because we actually have this clear idea of, I wanna do something that then has this ripple effect that goes out into the community in some way and changes the world. That's what we're all doing at our cores, right? Um, so, you know, for you to be able to say, I really wanna energize people and get them moving and get them engaged in the world in a different way, like I get so much clearer immediately who you are and what you want to do as a personal mission. So that's one of the things that I start to think about when I'm thinking about personal storytelling. And as I'm starting to think about strategies for organizations or for individual artists, for how they can start to gather people together, how do you start to tell your story? And I really believe that that starts with you as the person. That I can clearly walk into a room like this and say what I really believe in is making sure that I can gather a group of people together, as we are right now, that we can figure out what, what needs to happen, and that I can start to remove all the obstacles to success, whether I'm working with an organization or producing a play or directing. That's, what I, that's my personal mission. I want to get all of the obstacles to success out of people's way so that they can do their best work and be their best selves. And then that ripple effect goes out into the world. So even with a simple question like what piece of music are you, if you can start to then identify, yeah, that, that is me. And now I can effectively communicate that. And then if you can start to do that for your work, this is what I'm doing with my work. And my, my work is, I had a friend the other night, I asked that question too, because I was thinking about this. And he was like, oh, I'm shake, rattle, and roll by the, I don't know who it is. That's, I don't know if somebody can tell me who that is by the Ronelles or something, something like that. And he was like, yeah, because I want to shake people up. I want to rattle their preconceptions. And then I want to roll with them into some different way of thinking about the world. He was like, man, I, see now I already want to invest in whatever it is that you're doing. So storytelling is such a cool, is such, a, is such an important piece of this financing model that we're all talking about. You don't get to even have any of these conversations until you have a clear understanding of what it is that you're doing and why you want to do it in the world. With that being said, to me, what the most important piece of financing for both artists and organizations ultimately is going to come down to the individuals that you get to be your patrons in the true sense of the world, word, that are the people who are so ignited by your mission and your art 
that they want to give of their resources, whether that's money, the stuff in their garage, their wisdom, their time, their volunteerism, their energy, or their talent if you need to put on a play or that kind of thing. Um, so the only way to do that is by engaging people, right? You can't just go to somebody, ask them for money, and then walk away. You have to bring them in, help them to understand what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, and then engage them in the process of what you're doing. And I think that's something that we forget as artists. We forget how to show people how the sausage is made and that ultimately they're super interested in it. And it's what makes them want to continue to invest and not just give a one-time go away gift, right? The more that you're able to bring people in and engage them in whatever way it is, you know, do you have a, a conversation over coffee and explain your process? Or do you bring them to a rehearsal and let them sit in and watch and talk to the director and the actors? Or do you, but how are you helping them to have a deeper understanding of the value of the work that you are creating in the world so that then they want to say, yeah, you, I'm giving to you because I believe in what you're doing and I believe in the power of my support to allow you to get the obstacles out of the way to do your best work. People want, they want to support good things happening in the world. They really do. I truly believe that. Philanthropy is a, a spiritual thing. And the more we can be the solution to someone's desire, rather than feeling like a beggar, rather than operating from a scarcity mentality, operating from an idea of like, no, we're all doing this together to make the world a better place, the further we get. And the more people give, the more they want to give. So when someone says to me, oh, you know, you're working for that organization, well, they take all the donors. I'm like, bull, baloney. We are cultivating donors for every other organization out there because when people start to give to us and see the value of this organization in their lives, they're so much more likely to go, you know what, I'm going to go check out that dance piece or that other theater piece or that. We're cultivating philanthropists. We're cultivating arts lovers. So getting rid of the idea that we're in competition with each other, that's sort of the other big piece that I just want to like remove from the equation. So my three big things, don't talk about fundraising, talk about development and engagement and how you're bringing people in. Um, know your story first, why you do what you do, what kind of music are you or race car or piece of food or whatever it is that kind of gets you to say, yeah, okay, I know what I'm, I'm trying to say and your organizations. Be able to tell your story because your ultimate goal is to ignite the passion in others, whether it's a business or a foundation, an individual or a government entity or a, or a bank. And then get rid of the idea, and I don't think it happens very much in Vermont, I really don't, but get rid of the idea that we're operating in a scarce environment because we're not. We're not. And when people talk about recessions, not your problem. Don't worry about it. Keep doing your art, keep telling your story, and keep on getting people to engage it because in times of hopelessness, it's what they need most is your work. So those are kind of the big things, right? Yeah, preach! Um, so that's, so I, I guess I just wanted to, I just want, I wanted to kind of throw those things out there and then be able to kick out into the broader conversation because I think, Dom, that's sort of what you guys were really most interested in is like how then with these ideas of financing your vision, your dream, um, you know, what specifics do you have questions about or what are the kind of, or do you, does anybody else want to share what piece of music they are? <laughs> Maybe we should start with that. <laughs> are you guys going to kind of curate this conversation or what are you, are you thinking? Yeah, I was thinking. Don's like, I'm thinking I have a beer sitting on this table. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, well, does anybody have any questions to start out? I have a lot of questions. <laughs> this is, I have to say, too, that the reason I'm here is since Don and I have been friends for a few years, and this is like, when we sit down for coffee, you just said this tonight, you know, we'll sit down and have a cup of coffee, and everyone's like, two hours is never enough. You know, so like to be able to sit down and, and hear from more people right now, that is really cool. It's exciting. Is anybody looking for it? Oh, you have a question. Um, I'm just wondering if, uh, like, I applied for grants for years and years, and I'm always wondering whether there's a trend to the grants that are accepted, and do you see that when you're handing out the grants or, or 
reviewing them that there's like years that it's all answers or it's all you know like just curious you know we i have had conversations with my colleagues who have um, some of whom have been working at the arts council for a long time and there are um it's sort of like the 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 10 year spread where you see everybody in all of the disciplines getting funding, but there are years where it's heavy in literature or heavy in dance, and it's kind of interesting. But then when you look at the, a longer spread, it, it does. And now <coughs> find that the grant winners are all the same people in your career? Or? Um, there are some people who have. Um, received certain awards multiple times, um, but we we have um, some guidelines for like the creation grant, for example, is if you receive one, you aren't able to apply for three years, so that other people can kind of rise to the the top. Um, so there there's that. I'll throw something in there. Um, a couple times I had the extreme good fortune and personal benefit of participating in the review panels that the Arts Council pulls together. And what happens is uh, a meaningful number of peers from the arts community review the applications, discuss them for a day, score them in a way where at the end of the day, there's a spreadsheet on the projector, and you can see who came out loading to, you know, priorities as far as how the allotments made, distributions made. And from a professional development standpoint, that was some of the purest, best feeling, mutually supportive education I've ever been exposed to. So, if, you know, there's there's similar situations like in Burlington, you can get involved in the CDBG grants that the city distributes. Um, but this this uh, peer review, uh, very personal, conversational mode of distributing funds is just the most equitable I've ever seen. And, you know, I learned it from the Arts Council. I'm, I'm grateful for that since, since it happened. Did they record those real quick? In some like, like mm -hmm. Minnesota Arts Council, you can they, they actually send to the grantees, at least the organizational ones, they send the snippet of conversation, which is super useful because then you can know, like, oh, we did, even if you're doing something and you just didn't convey it in the grant application, you know, that's clear when they're like, oh, these people didn't talk about accessibility or whatever, then you're like, oh, for next year, I need to do that. So, we do yeah. cover and share comments mm -hmm. with, with everyone. Yeah. And I would also say that um, there is now a, a link on our website if you'd like to participate in a review or a panel where you can sign up and let us know what your your discipline is and your area of expertise. Um, and we're just, it's always great to have more people and more fresh eyes and, and experiences there at the table. It's so valuable too, to be on those really panels is. and to hear yeah. about other organizations and how they tell their stories. And yeah, it's really, Cool I want to ditto something too. You mentioned the reviewer notes, and it, it it isn't always that they say at the end of a review process, and would you like the reviewer's notes? You should all, especially if you're attached to an organization, feel like it's your responsibility to ask if they're available because they are valuable to suggest it. I will say though, too, I mean, and I, I I think what's hard is we, we do, as Alice mentioned before, too, we tend to, in our brains, put this focus on foundation support. And it is all, it's such a small piece of the pie, especially in Vermont. Especially here, yeah. It's such a small piece of the pie that I always wonder about that sort of, I, I get it because it feels like it's an easier way, but actually it's not because foundations, you also have to build these personal connections. In Northern Stage, we didn't start getting Vermont Arts Council grants really until we started you guys started coming down and you know really doing events at our new space and be like and getting a personal connection um that that was my experience anyway that that um so it, it i don't know if i just i just i i always get concerned about a focus on 
on grants only. I think it's a, a piece of the pie that we can't limit ourselves to thinking just about that. You know? and, and just to reiterate also, I, I do think we need to look at it and say, you know, really, how much time is this going to yeah. take me? And, you know, something like a micro loan might be mm -hmm. a better option if you know that it's like you just don't have the, the capacity to to take in all the to record all the kinds of information that you're going to need for a particular grant. And there's also the stumbling block for some, not with the Arts Council, fortunately, but with some granting organizations that you have to be a 501c3 with a certain number of dollars in per year and a certain audience base. And so in, for individual artists, it's a, it's a much harder road to hoe. Um, and you know, so then you have to get a, you have to have a um, fiscal sponsor and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, as a reviewer, what stuck out to you? What, what, how did artists stick out to you? Um, or where did you just say, "Wow, this blew my mind"? Um, God, I want to answer that question a slightly different way than you expect. What I, I think, what stuck out in the process the most was. It was always apparent when somebody just didn't follow instructions, and it cost them for no reason. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the pie. We're a small organization, and we don't we don't have a development director. Our board is trying to do this work, and one of the things we run into with grants is that. They are really labor intensive for a small amount of money that's short term. And we also don't have a lot of infrastructure for managing grants because we don't have staff to do that. And we're having that conversation about what is the pie? Like, yeah. What are the elements? Is it loans? Is it business sponsors? Is it moving beyond individual donors? So, can you talk a little bit more about what that pie yeah. entails? Yeah, I will say in my experience that individual donors are at least 50% of your contributed income pie. Or if you're actually you yeah, have your contributed income pie in general at organizations, and that leaves, you know, the other the other pieces for businesses and then for for grants. I will say again, in Vermont, it is it is really hard grants. It's not a, and, and especially because I exclude family foundations from that. The people that you can just write a letter. When I think of grants, I think of you have to fill out the application and you have to report. That's sort of my, you know, frame reference for it. Because there are some lovely family foundations, fortunately, that you can just be like, "Hey, Judy," you know, and it's you treat them more like an individual donor. Um, but yeah, fifty percent, and then I I don't in terms of the overall financing of an organization, that's where things like micro loans and then your your other forms of income, you know, your your transactional relationships or your earned income, whether that's rentals or sales or whatever that is. But a healthy organization in general. You want to have about 50% of your overall income from contributed sources. Um, and to me, I wish we would go to 65% because when we start to think about the transactional relationships, and maybe I'm thinking specifically about theater, um, you're, those, those can be one time, those transactional interactions versus cultivating a stewardship and loyalty-based relationship that really is going to be a long-term pipeline um, for stability and thrive for a thriving organization, that's going to come from um, your contributed sources. It just is. Also, business. I mean, we oh, business. We haven't totally. really talked about that much, yeah. but even you know everything from you know like the price chopper might give you three hundred bucks. Yay! You know, mm -hmm. um, and that's not labor intensive, and you know a lot of those kinds of organizations just want to support their local community. And then there's some big ones, you know, Montpelier and National Life is amazing. They support so many things um, and they're pretty easy to deal with. And, and you know, so I wouldn't discount that either. Oh yeah, no, that's huge. And that's, that's, and that again, I always think that also goes to how you, that's much closer to an, especially in a place like this, to an individual relationship because it is so much about you know we're not we're not talking target where you're going and talking to their corporate marketing director um but the the thanks that you might give will be different for a business because they are looking at it as marketing in a little bit more but um you also said something else too but now i blanked sorry i wanted to kind of piggyback off of that in the in the sense i see i see a lot of organizations where they hit that threshold. They've got a great track record as an organization. They they do have a good 
uh, audience, um, and they they need a dedicated person, a development person to do the work to get that that uh, to get that donor base. And it's kind of a question of the whole panel because it's like the chicken or the egg, you know, because you can't you can't materialize the money to get the person who will get you the money, you know. Um, and so, you know, we're is that a possible loan situation? I mean, like, how do you how do you find them the money to, to to hire a person that can go and get you more money? I mean, a skilled person, a development yeah, person yeah. with that background. And, and, and honestly, it's that that's an expensive position. Mm -hmm. You know, a skilled. But they're worth it because they'll pay. They will. They'll like pay themselves. You know, in but it. how do you how do you turn that corner? One rule of thumb that doesn't help with the cost really. Um, that I've heard in the past is one, if you hire a development person, also hire a program person because people want to talk to somebody who knows about the art. You know, mm -hmm. they, they want to talk to somebody like that's why they're interested in the organization. So if you have somebody who's, who's coming at it more from just a financial kind of perspective and they're not really in the culture of that organization and they don't really know what it is that you're doing artistically, then it can, it can work badly. I would, so, I would counter yeah. that by saying don't hire a development director that isn't engaged in the art. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, you know, you're right, Don, that you, there are really good capacity building grants out there. Um, and there are people who will give to not, not just the programs, but understand that the infrastructure of an organization is what makes the programmatic output possible. So there are individuals that will do that as well. So it's a matter of stating your priority of saying, we know we need this person to, to really bring our organization to the next level. And we're gonna invest, our board is going to invest and that's our next best hire. So how do we make that hire happen and then determining that with the staff. But I would bet micro loans would be a place too, or loans. You can get working capital loans, um, but it needs to be very focused as to why you're going to need it. So if it is for a payroll, um, on, on my perspective, when I'm looking at an application, um, I need to know that that working capital is going to be able to um, increase your revenue enough to be able to, to warrant having that loan um, payment back. So we don't want to extend you money that you that is just going to be a band-aid or eventually is just going to hold you. So understanding the expense, the upfront expense, what the end game is there and being able to articulate that if you are going out for, for a loan, I'm sure for a grant also, they're not going to, they're not going to want to grant you money for something that isn't necessarily going to work out. But um, so there, there, there are loans that you don't just need to, like, I need this piece of equipment. If I need the money for that, I need to, to borrow that. You can get working capital loans and you can get pieces. So it could be, you do need this piece of equipment, but you also need working capital towards a, some sort of salary. Um, in With the businesses that I work with, just because they're all pretty small and on a micro level, it's not going to be like a year's salary that, that we're going to be able to lend, but it might be six months worth of salary because you know at that point they'll be working towards income that's going to be able to, to pay themselves at that point. But So there are options to, to borrow that. Yeah, I Putting on another hat, taking off the Arts Council, I was also the executive director of a, a small community arts organization. And I think having a diverse funding stream is really important. Um, it's important to your funders. It's important as an organization. It's important for your stability. Um, so really having you know revenue from your programs, and if you're trying to be accessible, you know, and have uh, financial assistance, um, that's an important piece too. And um, having donations um, and building those relationships over time, in terms of. Um, hiring a development person, I think you kind of have to be at a certain level of maturity in your organization sometimes to, to get to that point. And a lot of times to get there, you are really depending on your board 
and uh, volunteers to help you to build it. And then once you've kind of proven yourself, then um, there are capacity building grants. There are a lot of foundations out there that, that do provide that kind of support. And I think that um, the funding world is changing to recognize that capacity is really important for organizations, um, especially when you're nonprofit and you're being uh, accessible to your community. And so taking the pie chart and looking at all of your different program areas, you know, a lot of funders kind of want to fund the programs, you know, but when you take it so that all of your programs um, have at the center the capacity, so each pie, each piece of your programming has that administrative piece and it helps, a, it's, a, it's a nice visual um, so that people really understand that you really need to be able to, to support your, um, your organization. thoughts. So coming from the Vermont Dance Lounge Alliance, which is very small and the board is completely active and doing projects on top of supporting me and the fundraising efforts. Um, but a project we just have pretty much solidified is fiscal sponsorship, which can be a lot of work. Mm -hmm. But if you're an artist um, that doesn't have a business, an LLC, or nonprofit status, and for us, if you're a member of the Alliance, then you can apply for our fiscal sponsorship program, which then allows you to apply for grants that require that status, and also to seek donations from businesses or people that may want it to be tax deductible if it's a high enough value. Um, so we are accepting, I think, three per year. So that's something to check out either through me or, or through Vermont Dance Lines or other organizations that may um, relate more to your genre. That's something we do too at the Center yeah. of Arts. Yeah. Yeah. What do you guys, do you guys do a fee? I'm just curious. Um, we fee. do, I believe it's 10% of, of yeah. any donations that yeah. come in and this okay. That's great. It's usually 10 or 15%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. That's a fiscal <laughs> And there are some big national organizations too yeah. that do that do that as well and provide other services. It's a it's a great thing. It, it, it kind of adds to the bookkeeping end of, of it, but it helps to get um, support. The other thing, so we talk a lot about the difference between a partner and a sponsor. So say Price Chopper is your sponsor, they give you that money to put their logo on your poster, but maybe um, ECA is your partner and you decide to have your event and together you work on the marketing and then their audience gets to see your work and it kind of merges um, your outreach. So kind of think of that as almost in the fundraising category, like who can we work with that has an audience or has more exposure. Um, engagement in the engagement category. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it, it, it is, I was going to also point out that partnerships are really great. Um, and I think that a lot of artists don't consider necessarily the partnerships that they can form. So the Arts Council has um, a number of grants that are for um, more community engagement. And so they're really looking for a partnership there a lot of times. But if you're an artist and you have a great idea for a public sculpture or you know some project that you'd like to do with the community, you can go to your local arts organization, a library or a municipality or you know, whatever seems to fit and, you know, pitch your idea and create a collaboration or a partnership. And a lot of funders also like to see buy-in um, from other people in your community. And so that kind of builds the support that other people have for your idea and your project. And you can kind of piece together. And, um, you know, we've also had um, for the creation grants $4,000, which is not a tremendous amount of money but um, artists have been able to leverage a creation grant award to then get funding from other uh, individuals or other grants. Um, there's matching grants. The Vermont Community Foundation, too, is a great place for um, grants to organizations and artists as well. I also want to throw into the, the mix of contributed income um, in-kind contributions. And I think it's something that we forget that we rely on, especially as small arts organizations rely on so heavily, you know, for somebody to say, I'm going to give you this space 
or I'm going to give you, you know, um, three nights in a hotel room for this reading series that you're going to do or whatever. Um, and I, the reason that I say that's so important is to, to be able to, to track those in-kind gifts that save your bottom line actual cash, not the ones where somebody's like, oh, I have a sweater. And you're like, oh, I might be able to use that in five years. I don't know. But the ones that actually save your organization budgeted cash and making sure that those go in to your contributed income sort of tracking so that you can continue to build that relationship so that you're you're showing you're treating those people like the donors that they are and so that you're able to show the actual cost of what it takes to run your business or your your organization we we tend to go oh um, well, this project only cost three thousand dollars. Well, no, it didn't because you got the space for free, and you're able to house your artists for free, and you got this car. Somebody lent you a car, so actually, your project, including your administration piece, was about ten thousand dollars. And you want to know really what it's costing you to put your work, on, you know, to do your work. And so, I just in-kind donations are definitely another, along with businesses, individuals, foundations, government, um, another piece of that financing puzzle that just tend to get sort of neglected um, and can be incredibly valuable. So you're, and you're, you're saying to make, make, a, make, make a note of that in, yes. your, in your budget, in your spreadsheets and, you know, after the fact, you're, yes. not, you're not calling a project, a $7,000 project, when it's really a $15,000 project, to make yes. sure that you're, you're annotating everything. Exactly. If you said, hey, I'll build your website for this thing, I would be like, man, that's a $3,000 cash savings to my budget. You know, which would you do that? <laughs> and that makes you look better as an organization, too, organization yes. too, in many ways, right? When you're trying to get those individual donors, you're saying, you're saying, look, we're really good at saving our bottom line. So the money, the cash money you get us will it's really be stored. Yeah. Is really, is really well maintained because yeah. we're also doing and what it does too is it provides a lot of people who might not ordinarily be able to be donors to donate because they say, oh God, I don't have enough money, but I have this extra bedroom. Is that useful to you? Or, you know, or one of the programs we set up at um, Northern Stage that has been a huge cost saving uh, is a dining and lodging program where restaurants give us, you know, 500,000 or 500,000, 500 <laughs> to $1,000. They're treated as a sponsor like we do with our business sponsors. Um, and then we use those, we, we take our cast out to dinner or we, you know, we take donors out to dinner. It's been an incredibly valuable tool for both our production and our administration side. We do it with lodgers, uh, with lodging establishments as well. They're able to give us weeks of hotel room stays um, that end up saving us thousands of dollars from our bottom line. And you're right, our board looks at that and goes, cool, this was the budget. We see that you're actually living up here. And we also see that actually in that space, is this in-kind contribution that, that you very clearly laid out. Those people are also seeing the benefits. We're putting their logos in the programs, all of that kind of thing. I see. Oh, uh, a couple of questions. I, I get, I'll just shout it out. Um, it, it's cool to be optimistic about approaching funding sources, but part of one of the tripwires is so many of them have deadlines that you have to be aware. And one of the friendly ways of being aware of some of those opportunities is to get on mailing lists for institutions like the Arts Council. Um, if, if you'd like to take note, email me, jim, at bigheavyworld.com, and I would gladly add you to the Chittenden County Create Zone uh, newsletter, which includes some of that as I come across. And there's, there's, there's plenty of, you know, like uh, other organizations, national and state, that it's worth just getting their mail so you don't miss anything. Um, so I'm the coordinator for a very small um, organization called the Howard Center Arts Collective. And we um, kind of grew organically as a group of artists, both staff and clients at the Howard Center, all volunteer run for many, many years. And um, the last year and a half, we started to get some funding, and wrote our first proposal got a little bit of funding from the Howard Center. Um, and we've been successful in getting um, a handful of grants over the last year and a half, um, one from the Vermont Community Fund, the SPARC grant, um, mm -hmm. a couple other small organizations gave us um, 3000 So all of our grants have been $3,000, um, which has been fantastic. But my, I come from a different field where the amount of work in writing these grant proposals always brought in more like fifty to $100,000. 
um, when I look at what's required in these, these proposal guidelines, um, and I'm not paid to write grants, I'm coordinator of the program, so um, I generally end up doing that in my spare time, my volunteer time. Um, so I guess my question is, uh, if someone, I think someone up there already said that it, there tends to be very small grants in the state of Vermont, usually under 5,000. I haven't seen anything over 5,000. Um, do any of you have any experience for small organizations, um, guidelines or, or resources for getting grants maybe in the 10 to 20 range um, outside, potentially outside of Vermont? Um, you know, there must be somewhere that we can go as small Vermont-based organizations that, that um, you know, kind of make that leap to the next level. Um, and the other thing that goes along with that is we've been discouraged from including staff time in the grants that we apply for, and um, I just don't get it. Like, we, <laughs> there's nothing we can do without staff time. Everyone seems to want to fund um, art supplies, um, Maybe some, um, you know, hotel support, food support for trips, but staff time doesn't easily get funded. Um, so we end up, you know, having lots of art supplies <laughs> and, and lots of money for food, um, but we can't do things because we can't pay our staff unless we continue to volunteer, which we do. Um, so those two things, like larger grants and also staff time. Are you are you able to? I, I don't know that much about the Howard Center, but are you able to kind of come at it from the social service or medical services kind of angle? The reason I ask is we had a fantastic when I was at the Vermont Studio Center. Most of their grants are for individual fellowships for artists, so so the funding pays for an artist to be there for a month, basically. Um, and we had one that was fantastic that was a multi-year, very large grant for people with uh, spinal column injuries to come and be in this, artists with spinal column injuries to come and be in the studio center. So, but that was from an organization that was focused on that medical side of things, you know, and, and expanding opportunities for people with that very specific condition. Yeah. So I don't know if that, you know, yeah. non-arts grants might our, be a, a way. Our to organization has its own fund, fundraising department, development department, sorry, um, and they, uh, so we do get a little bit of money from them and they seek out the funding on that front, um, and the line we usually get is they're very stretched, it's just <coughs> the nature of social services. So we get a little bit of money from the agency, from the fundraising they do on that front, um, and we have to go after money that's arts. Can I, can I ask you, in the hours, if you've got, let's say you put 10 hours into writing a grant, is there a reason why you wouldn't instead say to your staff and your board, instead we're going to put those 10 hours into setting 10 meetings with individual pe with people to bring them into this organization? I'm, I, the reason I say that is, in my experience, in the seven years I've now been in Vermont, there are bigger grants here. Um, and the national ones, it's... It, it takes a lot of, it, um, it, just, it usually is for capital campaigns. Yeah. You'll get some bigger grants like that. And, and then also, or from very specific funders going for very, you know, an in-school program that they want you to start up and it's a, and the dog might start to wag, or the, the, it might start to, you know, be a, a wag, the, wag the dog kind of situation where you're then creating programming in order to achieve larger grants. So I'm just curious, like if you looked at the amount of time that you're looking at these grants and you're able to say, okay, really what we're trying to do is create a stronger development program, can we re-strategize that time into talking to people who are directly impacted by this work, by our work, that maybe will want to start donating and see if you start to see more value in the time and you're able to more clearly tell your story of, this is our whole organization. It takes this amount of staff, this amount of resources, these this number of lights, everything to do the programs that you see and the you know the value. So with individuals, you're able to tell that story in a, in a more clear way, and with businesses too, frankly. Um, if you're, I would say, going to businesses, 
places like Mastoma Bank have foundations. Hypertherm has foundation, but you guys might be a little far out from those very specific regional granting opportunities or funding op funding opportunities. Um, yeah. There are a lot of um, banks that have mm -hmm. foundations. So there are a lot of um, businesses that are larger have um, their community sponsorships that they will um, give out. And then they also on a, a higher level have um, the grant funding that are larger. And you know, Google searching and there are some, I cannot think of them right now, but there are some great databases for grants where you can find um, very either location, community specific, or the type of work that you're doing specific um, funding where, you know, philanthropists have their particular interests that they really want to support. And the Vermont Community Foundation is a great place to, to go. Um, they do a lot of um, donor cultivation and help people invest and so it's nice for them to know about you if you're an organization and know the kind of work that you're doing. We're getting we won a smart grant. Right and then another thing in terms of um, when you're writing a grant you mentioned the administrative part of it um, that people want to fund program supplies and uh, the instructive cost or whatever it is but 25% um, is a legitimate amount of administrative time to build into your request. That's accepted, um, and uh, you can also say program development, which is specific to a program, and you can put that in there. I think that people, uh, funders tend to want to shy away from um, your operational costs, but you, know, you, you can put in a little more uh, specific pieces. It's not a lot, yeah. ultimately, but you, it is. Does anyone here know about Patreon? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> um, it's, it's basically like a monthly payment option for donors. Um, uh, you can sign up to support me or my community, and it'll just automatically pull out of your bank account um, a monthly payment you choose to sign up for. So, so if you sign up for it as an artist, is it kind of like one of these other like platforms where is it the kind of thing that you would use to reach out to someone you have a relationship with to say like, hey, if you want to support my work, you can do it easily through this Patreon program? Or is it also the type of thing where like uh, people who don't have a relationship with you or are interested in the work you're doing might find you through that, through that app and also support you through that? I think there's a little bit of both. Um, I think that there is a community in Patreon and people often will go and see what the top donors are and where the top people are on Patreon and think, oh, maybe I'll support them too. So that community definitely exists for supporting people that you don't know. Uh, but I think that it mostly is about capturing people that know your art, want to support your art, and it's capturing them for long term because they have to physically stop the monthly payment process. And so you're kind of capturing them for longer term than just a one time. I think there's also a kind of a, a an aspect to it that's sort of like almost like Kickstarter, where you could like I've, I've known some people are authors who use Patreon, and they might do you know a two page short story that only the Patreon donors get mm -hmm. at a certain point. You know, like there's some kind of subscription yeah, aspect to it, yeah, like that. A bloggers too. They'll offer stuff. YouTubers, <laughs> lots of YouTube channels will offer people to come and say, hey, if you enjoy it, hit like and all this and join us on our Patreon channel. Yep. You get special content. You get yes. a few videos before or uh, special videos. Podcasters. Podcasters. Uh, they'll they'll have a regular chance. So uh, the first one I think I saw on this was, you know, people who review music they've never heard before. Mm -hmm. and but the app itself does And, and it's just sure. like that's their whole no. No, YouTube your channel. Yourself. They basically have fans and they just say to them, oh, if you want to hear me review that, it's a vocal coach who like, tells you all about the, this singer that's doing this and that. Well, if you want to hear special content, go to my you know Patreon and you can get special content uh, and, and just by signing up and paying me every month. And you, you can and you can get special requests then for I can review something you, you know, if you're at this level. What the next thing is, I get to re I review. Or swag. Some of them do swag. Yeah, I T-shirts and stuff. Swag. Yeah, just like, but just like you're saying, it starts <laughs> offering you uh, some type of premium for your payment um, each month. Yeah, I have a question. 
I had sort of an intro to Grant's question, like Grant's one, on like preliminary steps through potentially getting the grant, um, especially if you're looking to start an organization and you already have one. Um, I think, well, figure out what it is you're doing. So there's that. Yes. And be able to write that down in a small number of words. <laughs> like literally that is the place to start because a lot of the time that's a hard thing to do. So come up with your 25 words, your 500 words, and your 5,000 characters, you know, kind of version of what it is that you're doing. Um, have your budget in order, you know, so you know what money it is you're asking for, what it's, what it's going to fund, even if, you know, ultimately you would still probably do the project if you got less, but this is ideally what you would get and you know, what the breakdown is for that. Um, when you find some funders or some grants that you think would be a good fit, one thing that I think a lot of people don't know is you can look at their tax forms. So you can go on um, GuideStar, it's like a free service um, that you can sign up for and any organization, that any charitable organization will file their um, 990 forms, which are their, their tax forms. If you go to those forms and you scroll kind of like all the way to the end, there's a part where it says who they've given money to. And that can be really, really useful because if you, you know, especially for things like family foundations where you might find the opportunity, but you really have no idea if you're a good fit. Um, so you can look at those forms and say like, oh yeah, I am like these things. Or look, these people all got $2,500 and so I shouldn't ask for $10,000, you know? So that can be a useful thing is find out what else they've funded. Also, a lot of them will have on their website examples of what they've funded. Um, I think that, you know, knowing that, knowing if you're a good fit is, is probably one of the most important things. And then just write clearly. I think a lot of people- Don't make mistakes. Uh, yeah, a lot of people try to kind of, you know, make themselves sound like more professional. Don't do that. Just like really clearly write what you're doing so that somebody, I mean, you imagine that the person who's reading it is reading 50 of them today. <laughs> and by the last one, they're going to be really sick of the same language. They're going to be really sick of, you know, sort of overblown claims. Like just, just write what you're doing. And, and I think if you're passionate about it and you kind of know the challenges that you're facing and how you're going to navigate those, that's kind of the best way to go. And then there's an application and proposal and is there like interviews or has like a test at all? Totally depends. Sometimes sometimes it might be a family foundation where you, you write the letter, you say this is what we're doing and the person decides. Sometimes it's extensive online forms with a lot of um, statistics if you're an organization um, or you know if you're an individual artist it might you know you might need to include your taxes or something like that um, so it, it totally depends on the organization and the, and the specific grant and sometimes they will do if you're lucky they will do site visits or yeah. interviews you know it's one of the things the Vermont Arts Council is awesome about that it, that's a great thing when you're able to yeah. talk in person yeah. um, I would say just to add into that too just make sure you do due diligence. If if they do need you to have a fiscal sponsor, make sure you've got that lined up. If they do need you to have a budget size of a certain and you're not there yet, don't apply. Don't waste their you know don't waste their time. Or, and one of the things with due diligence again, depending on the organization, is most grant program officers are so willing to talk to you and they're so awesome. Like they really, really, really want to help you. They want your application to be. Right, like we want your application to be as clear and you know amenable to the review committees committees as possible. So, um, and they're not the one reading your application. Right. So yeah. You can be totally straightforward with what's in your application. And sometimes too, you can, you know, not every organization has a program officer right. or has the information about who that person is. But if you can get in touch with that person. You know, you can say like, does this sound like it's a project that would be a good fit for this grant? And sometimes they'll say like, no, but next spring we have this other thing that would be a better idea for you. Um, also, try to remember that it will come back around. <laughs> so if it's 11.59 p.m. on the submission 
you know, and you, you don't have it together, do it next year. So you know, don't kill yourself. And so it. just last thing on that too, that foundations like individuals require cultivation. Mm -hmm. They really do that, you know, just dropping a grant in and that's like, you, you do have to keep them updated. You do have to make sure they know the work that you're doing, you know, that it, it's not a one and done deal ever for the foundation, in my experience. <laughs> and make sure that you, have, if there's a report that's due at the end, because a lot of them have a report that's due at the end, make sure you actually do it. Yeah. Sometimes it's very simple, but a lot of the times, especially smaller organizations, especially if there's a lot of turnover, that just falls by the wayside. And then you apply the next year and they say, wait a minute, we never heard what happened to that other money. So, yeah. And if there's a change, if for some reason, you know, you're halfway through your year and they've granted you the money and can't do the project or you have to tell them. make a big change to the project, you tell them. Yeah, that's important. I, the Arts Council is going to have some grant seeker workshops if you're interested in any of the Arts Council's um, funding. And those will be in um, February and March. And uh, we'll hopefully have one of those in a webinar that you can just watch from wherever, whenever, <clears throat> as well. And I would say that, you know, just read very carefully through all of the guidelines. And a lot of them, like the Arts Council, has tip sheets and suggestions for a stronger application. And really um, look closely through all of those materials and um, build relationships with people. Feel free to call the, because they're not going to be reviewing themselves. And so, you know, ethically <coughs> can help you as much as as possible and they sometimes can help you in the in the review i've had this happen when i've been on a review panel when i'm like hey, I'm, I'm not seeing this in the application and the person you know the program officer is like i know that they do that by the way you know so that it's good to have that advocate too <laughs> Say quickly, the Vermont Community Foundation, if you go to their website, they offer different categories of support, but they also provide free access to a foundation's directory that is searchable by keyword. And it's it's really the key to the kingdom for discovering support out there. Um, so don't lose track of that because that's that's a real uh, a real supportive resource that they make available throughout. I think it's Vermont Seattle. Um, they might have to peek around the site to find it, but it's a foundation's director. Um, and just, I had my idea to hand up. Why don't you go right ahead? Uh, so I heard a couple things you were talking about when uh, Amanda, you were talking about like you know, explaining like what kind of piece of music you would be, um, really getting into like how the sausage is made, the couple things you said. Uh, but then also I'm hearing, be very clear and concise about what you're doing. Yeah. Um, can you tell me like the balance there? And yeah, I think it all comes together. It is, if you're able to clearly and concisely tell your story in a passionate way, right? Because that's ultimately what those, what those things are about, is demonstrating the value and the impact that you're creating in the world. Impact is really key. Like really giving the grant review panel uh, understanding of what your impact, the impact of whatever it is you're um, proposing is going to be, um, and being very specific, saying this is great, is that really telling people anything? And then if you have a word count, you know you don't want to waste it on this is great. Like they want to know what's great, you know, or what, how is it? and giving specifics. And also not assuming that people understand what you're talking about is another thing, like just making sure that you don't make assumptions that people are imagining what you're imagining. I think that that with the, um, the grant review that I've been a part of um, is often one of the things where people just um, miss but, an opportunity. but listen, this isn't just about grants. I just yeah. I want to keep yeah. saying that. That's also about how you communicate with your individual, with your potential individual supporters, and that can be your mom. That you know, um, wouldn't be my mom, but it could be somebody's mom. Um, but or a business, or so. When I was talking about that's just a, that that idea of 
sort of being able to that exercise of you know what piece of music am i is just another way of articulating what you're doing in the world right and then you can kind of pull the thread and and help and it creating your case is one of the most important things that you can do whether you're applying for a grant or sitting down with a donor and i would say the other most important thing you can do is if you're writing something getting someone else's eyes on it not just for proofing but also for clarity of storytelling and if you're going to meet with someone whether it's a business or an individual or a foundation rehearse I mean, like, do sit down with someone else and say, this is what I'm going to say, and then say it out loud so that when you're in the room, you're very, you're clear with the impact that you're doing and you feel comfortable and you're not, you know, sweating <laughs> um, because ultimately they, they really, these, this is, um, it's an opportunity to share what you do and looking at it that way instead of as this, okay, I have to impress, I have to audition, I have to, whatever that is, but here's this gift that I have of 15 minutes of your time where I get to tell you about the, the impact I'm making in the world. The Community Foundation does something fun, at least some of their applications at the very end of that question is, tell us a story. And yeah. it's just yeah. so sweet because you just get to change your channel entirely. You just get to, you know, write something totally personal that shows your values and bring it into the conversation with the funder. Yeah, and listen, that's what I do. That's 90% of what I do with organizations that I'm working with is, is figure out how we're communicating so that we're igniting the fire in someone else. And it's just so key. Yeah, I had a question from someone who couldn't be here tonight. Um, <laughs> they had to be club and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he received a nomination for a fellowship that he had never heard of before, but something called the United States Artists sounds so generic that he just swore it must be some something non-legit, but I think it looked legit. So have you, have you guys ever heard of something called the United States first fellowship? No. No. <laughs> no, but I mean dig dig around. That's cool. <laughs> as long as he doesn't have to give money to them. Yeah, that's yeah. Just, <laughs> apply, he's supposed to fill out an application, but apparently you have to be invited to uh, to apply. That's probably why we haven't heard about it. We <laughs> um, I'm thinking a lot about fundraising as an event and all the effort that it can be to create a program or an experience to gain money and why not just add it to a performance or a gallery exhibit um, or a lecture that you're already giving. Maybe it's a silent auction that can bring in four to six hundred dollars. Maybe it's you sell a t-shirt and then your logo's out in the community. Maybe it's concessions and you get donations. So just thinking of your events that you're already really working hard on to get the word out, to add just like a little thing that might bring in somebody that could really help with some expense that you would have to pay for otherwise. Versus planning a huge fundraising event and, and no more auctions. people come. No more auctions. Yeah. So. And, and they also don't, I don't know what, your experiences of other places, but for sure, when I was in Minnesota, you know, we did a big gala thing, and like people spend lots of money and fancy dresses and heels and whatever, and it's at nighttime. And here, that does not work because people want to be like in bed by eight. Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't. It's dark and snowy. It's, like, it's not the gala thing. It doesn't seem to be a thing here. So. <laughs> Just stick around till next summer. <laughs> I think again, it's a balance of, of fundraising events. So you have, you know, your time intensive gala or annual fundraiser that you do, which could be a product interview. Like it could be a lot of things, and have your conventional, traditional auction and things. But then you can have other events throughout the year too that are less <coughs> intensive with efforts and just kind of having those opportunities across your. I'm 100% with you on like the more you can engage people in the actual work you're doing, the, the it's so good, so good. Um, I think if you are doing a big event, then thinking about the purpose aside from just raising dollars, but how are we gathering energy? What are the, like, how are we really expressing our mission and our work? I was at a fundraiser in upstate New York, not in Vermont this past summer. 
they didn't mention the programs of this organization. They literally, it was just a big fancy party to have at somebody's house. It doesn't do any good for the organization or the individual artists on the long-term basis because you're not saying, you know, you're, it, this is your opportunity. If you gather people together, share your story for the love of God, you know. Um, so to, to be really clear with your, if you've got a committee or sometimes boards really like it because they see it as like, um, friend cultivation which i i get um my thing is like well then don't charge for it <laughs> like let's have a party i'm happy to throw a party because i really believe that if you if you if you want to cultivate that kind of energy that's great but then you have to follow up and the follow through almost invariably never happens because people just get so slammed so think really really strongly about why you're doing any of that whether it's a potluck dinner or a, a sing-along Christmas carols, or a big gala auction thing. Think about the purpose of it, and then the time investment that you're making. Because you may like some grants where you're like, "My God, that's 500 pages for two thousand dollars." Maybe instead, I just need to have meetings with five donors in the 20 hours that that would take me. You know, that, that really do start to weigh those things because. Um, it does take all of those pieces to make a strong financing uh, model for your organization and to rely on an event. And also it's knowing- It's risky, it's risky. And knowing who each different kind of thing is for. Right. It's also really helpful. I mean, that's, I, I, I've only been in my position for about a year and, and that's really been one of the biggest challenges for me is figuring out who are the people who are supported supporting this organization and why and what are the different, in our case, we have lots of different populations that do it for different reasons and are interested in different kinds of events. So knowing that can be really helpful. Does anyone know about examples of um, historical societies partnering with, well, we're working on theater piece, but for anything, you know, with in examples of what they're looking for is like Are you, you're looking for, I'm sorry, a historical society to do a theater piece with? Is that what you're, I'm sorry. We have a we have a we have a musical that is uh, based in colonial Vermont. Oh, cool! And so there's a lot of uh, like real local stuff woven in. Cool. And um, so we applied last year for some grants, partnering uh, much like your organization does uh, with uh, the Virginia Historic Society. Oh, yeah. Because it, bunch of the production is centered in, in Virginia. So, um, <coughs> I attended a, a New England museum conference that was held in Burlington recently. And one of the most interesting conversations I had was with somebody from a museum in Boston, I think. And his job was to coordinate the history based performances that happened at the site of this place. And it was just so cool to have something that you might think of as more formalized, reaching out to you know, entire swaths of demographics who would be participating in the drama. The Vermont Humanities Council has mm -hmm. a presenters, a touring presenters. Um, that might be something that and New England Foundation on the Arts, NIFA, has um, great presenting grants where presenting organizations partner with individual groups. Um, and, you know, it might be if you're able to find a partner organization that would be willing to with you apply that to NIFA for those ones. But, um, I mean, finding an organization that, that fits with what you're hoping to do is the, is the most important thing, right? That's And that's... I, I mean, there are lots of examples of this. Again, sorry, we like harking back to Minnesota, but there's like, there's Minnesota Historical Society, actually, have a, there's a theater in Minneapolis that specifically does that kind of work, developing plays to tell the stories of Minnesota. We went there. Yeah, did you go there? Did you say you went there? No, I didn't, but we walked there. I know. Yeah, they're kind of locally specific, yeah. You want to be able to partner with a school or something, too. We, we thought, Talked about that as well um, as one of the grants, but that would involve uh, you know, a curriculum. Yeah, a component. Yeah. Yeah. That strikes me too as a bunch of that a big in kind uh, support situation. You know, 
know, and uh, of those historical societies might not have money to give, but I bet that they would throw themselves at that project. And totally. However, else can help. And for for contacts, because outreach. Yeah. yeah. For what it's worth, the state historical society you know, has maybe hundreds of contacts in the state for local historical. Check out the Marble House Presidency in Georgia. It could be an interesting site to study. I'm curious to know about it. Oh, Marble House? Yeah. Abby, I have a question, a question for you. We just quarter it out of time. Um, um, first of all, I, you know, someone from the community, uh, long time or community bank, uh, without another art spend, and it just blew my mind. I never thought of loans as an option for artists ever. Right? You know, um, uh, it just just kind of opened my eyes to that. Um, do would you say that that um, art? Do you always rely on some kind of collateral for a loan, or would, would you base loan off of previous success? So, for example, like if I had done like a show every year, uh, and I had a margin of ticket sales that was somewhat reliable, and then I say I wanted to do two shows next year, but I just needed a little bit more capital to do that, or, or something like that. But if I, if, I, if I could point to some sort of measurable past successes, could I get a loan? So our loans aren't uncollateralized, but we're very creative with the collateral. So, um, all the time, we're going to take business assets as part of the collateral towards the loan. And honestly, sometimes that's pretty much nothing, but you know, it's still a collateral towards it. But I, talking about these grants, and when you go to a lender, um, you know, explaining your vision or not necessarily working with a creative person who really understands the value of what you're doing is really kind of it can be hard to explain what what you're doing and why you need funding. So having grants or having a history of support is really helpful and beneficial to explain your mission and what you're doing. So part I any small loans are all internal, but anything over fifteen thousand has to go to our loan committee, which is a broad spectrum of people throughout the state. And so they're going to be looking at it from a lot of different ways. And there's other lenders, there's past borrowers, um, past board members. So they really want to understand what you're doing. So being able to say that you've got these grants, so that there is some support there. Um, knowing that, yes, you've had successful events or shows, um, so there is a community. The community is going to get behind with what you're going to do. You're going to be able to, to make an income moving forward. Um, crowdfunding, I know that was really, it was going to be discussed. And crowdfunding is very hard to, it's not just you're putting it out there and you're going to get this money back. There's a lot of different, um, there's, there's different types of crowdfunding. So sometimes you actually won't get any money unless you reach your goal or um, you know, it's very focused on um, what what you're you're funding for but having a successful crowdfund I'll bring that to a loan committee and let them see that you've done this and it could be just a small portion of what the, the whole money is at the end that you need but it shows that there's people out there that are are supportive of you and are getting behind what what you're doing so as a lender, having that past history is, is really good to kind of explain to people who don't understand what you're doing, because they're not necessarily, for grants and such, it's very focused, and you're going towards grants that are going to be able to understand what, what you're working for, but lenders aren't necessarily going to, to be that. So um, so I kind of answered and then <laughs> there is there is collateral. We always need it. All our loans are collateralized. But we can work. It's different ways of being able to do that. That's because we are. We're not a traditional lender. We're not a bank. A bank is going to look at things differently. They are going to want real, tangible things for collateral. But um, but our organization doesn't can look beyond that. But you're also just saying talk talk to them. like like we should absolutely re, you know we should not discard those not we shouldn't think that we know the answer that you're going to give us. Oh, we should, yeah. We should make sure to talk to you if we have. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
And, and again, if if I don't have the answer or I see potential, but you need to develop it a bit more, we can connect you with somebody who can, can get you there. And maybe they can help you to, to get to a point where you don't need to go out and actually go home and actually and do that, get more debt. But um, but at least they're they're helping you thrive, and that's really what we want. Um, What's the interest rate you guys charge? So we're at eight to ten and a half percent right now, and depending on, um, it's either as well. It can be as as little as you want time wise, but three to five years is usually what we do. Yep. And do you do you loan outside of Vermont, or is it only? No, Vermont? only Vermont businesses. Yeah. And your your cap is a hundred thousand. Our cap is a hundred, but that's a very hard number yeah. to get to. But as I said, our, our average is is. 25,000, so um, that's kind of 25 to 40 is, is a good number for us. One last question. Um, well, I wanted to share a, a platform called shareyourself.org, which is pretty new, and uh, they're getting little smaller markets, but people make this change. So um, it's about doing good in the world, and uh, like there's uh, lots of people who are not doing this, and not doing this, but it's really immediately by you who participates in your programs who comes to your events who start talking to them first that's where you find your donors is in your family of people who participate does that help uh, I, I don't know no, they don't have that much money. I know it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean honestly it doesn't it, you know and like I said before money is just a piece of it it could be time talent they could also be like you know I don't but but let's have a conversation because you know what, my brother-in-law's a lawyer and he really wants to, you know what I mean? Like you just don't know until you start talking to people. And look, I just want to say this too, these kinds of conversations and, and building a family, and it, it does, it takes time. It absolutely takes dedicated time, but it is the thing that will um, provide the foundation for your organization to thrive. It is worth the investment. Building those relationships and mm -hmm. cultivating your donors and turning your friends more people. and board members too and volunteers and inspiring them if they're inspired they're going to want to you know, bring other people in and find more resources for you so that um, it can happen yeah but there's no yeah there's no silver bullet unfortunately <laughs> there's, no what? there's no silver bullet you know there's no yeah it's it. yeah. Thank you so much. And one last thank you to our sponsors. Come to the arts, Community Capital of Vermont, Art Digital, Main Street Performing Arts Center, and the Radio Years. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all for coming. Great weather. Safe drives home. Or join us if you drink some whiskey before you drive. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.